Crisis Day is a podcast from a female-founded destination practice that believes that crisis isn't an if, it's a when. We are an organization unafraid of crisis, but have never known one to be resolved in a single day. However long the day or night that gave rise to the crisis in the first place, there's always something we can learn. I'm Leah, the founder and CEO of Broadstairs Consulting, a problem-solving consultancy offering crisis and governance advisory services to help leaders and organizations thrive and flourish. We operate in the gap between legal and public relations at the coalface of difficult situations, believing that most crises are avoidable and the impact of inevitable ones usually can be mitigated. Our guests have overcome a litany of crises. Many of our guests have worked with us in some capacity in the past. All of them have stories worth hearing. We trust them to make this worth your while. We hope it helps you trust us. Today on The Longest Day, we welcome Lieutenant General Arundel David Leakey, one of the most recognisable faces in British politics, a colourful and influential senior figure in the Houses of Parliament as Gentleman Usher of the Black Rod, to give its full title. He was previously a general with a distinguished career commanding multinational forces on NATO and EU operations, including counter piracy in the Indian Ocean, and a succession of posts at the very top level of military, commercial, national, and multinational organisations, as well as in the political complex of Parliament, Westminster, Whitehall, and Brussels. David has chaired boards and meetings of ambassadors and defence chiefs, major commercial enterprises, national charities, committees and boards in Parliament, as well as in government departments and not-for-profit areas. He was educated at Sherburn School, went on to read law at Cambridge University, and then passed out at the Royal Military Academy in Sandhurst. Well, David, thank you so much for being willing to come on the podcast. Well, it's a pleasure, Leah, to see you, as always. Thank you. Well, perhaps you might like to tell our listeners about your longest day. Let me set a little bit of context first. Um, The context is Parliament. My role was Black Rod. Not many people know actually what Black Rod does. Um, Dressed up in a Victorian Victorian, uh, 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 coat and uh, silk stockings and uh, and banging on the door of the House of Commons to summon MPs to the state opening, uh, to the Queen's speech or the King's speech at the state opening of Parliament. And nobody knows more beyond that. But one of the roles of Black Rod, at least when I was Black Rod, uh, and I retired five years ago and much must have changed in that time, but one of the roles was for uh, supervising security, emergency response, contingency planning, relocation planning, and disaster recovery. So if there was ever an emergency in the house, uh, some sort, and the emergencies could be uh, of all sorts, um, floods, um, a utilities outage, a blackout of some sort, a terrorist incident, a security incident. And of course, there would be different responders, first responders, who would have primacy in fixing the problem, whether it was a security problem, that would be the police, if it was a power outage of the utilities and power company to make sure that it was safe and restoring light and so on. So they'd be the the, the responders. But the problem about a place like Parliament is that you've got to orchestrate all the people there to allow the responders to do their business. So on this particular day, there was a, it doesn't matter what the security incident was, but there was a significant security incident at the gate of Parliament. In the end, it turned out that there was only one, um, let's call him a miscreant uh, rather than a terrorist or a dissident or whatever, but there was one miscreant who, who caused a lot of damage and injury, but there was only one. But it wasn't clear to the police or the security officers around the incident at the gate on the external part of Parliament whether other miscreants had already entered Parliament or were entering Parliament at the same time as the police were distracted by that one incident. And because the miscreant was armed or thought to be armed, there was then a heightened response from the police. And... If there are armed terrorists at loose inside 
any building, whether it's an office block or an airport uh, or parliament, uh, there are certain protocols, um, not just for the police and the responders, but actually for the people inside. And one of those is not to put yourself in the way of harm. And one of the ways not to put yourself in the way of harm is to stay locked in your room. So when the alarm went off, the security control run by or supervised by the police um, ordered everybody to essentially stay locked in their room whilst um, the security um, officers and the police systematically searched the whole of Parliament to make sure that they had either that there either weren't any uh, miscreants in the building or that they um, could contain or and ideally detain them. And that really all sounds pretty straightforward, except that in Parliament you haven't got a um, a disciplined constituency of people. You have a constitu you have many constituencies of by and large self willed and undisciplined people, if I can put it that way. And I don't mean just parliamentarians, peers and MPs. I'm talking about tourists, visitors to the galleries, very important people uh, from um, celebrities, uh, media stars, uh, sportsmen, uh, captains of industry, all sorts of people visiting Parliament. And of course, the press, the media, many of them, hundreds of them in Parliament at any one time, uh, including the parliamentary staff, um, the MPs and members' staff, um, they're all in there as well. And so whatever the security uh, announcement was, and people, uh, when they hear an announcement, should do what the security control announcers say, and um, by and large, that was the case. But in Parliament, you have two separate entities, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. These are two separate corporate entities, two separate legal entities. They are two separate constitutional entities. They're very proud um, of their independence of each other, even though they occupy one building and even though they are one under one set of uh, security arrangements and, and security force. Um, and it was interesting that uh, in this set of circumstances, people decided to do their own thing. Um, the speaker of the then speaker of the House of Commons um, actually responded very well in the first incident instance, uh, and then gave an instruction uh, to members in the chamber um, as to what they should do, which was different to the um, the speaker in the House of Lords at the time, um, who followed a different protocol and gave a different instruction to his members in the chamber. Uh, and, and that was just one example, because uh, then there were, there were members in different parts of Parliament, uh, not in the Palace of Westminster where the incident was, and the Palace of Westminster is just one building that can be contained off. And there were members in other parts of the building who wanted to come and see what the problem was, and and even some members who told the police that they had no right to impede them going about their business in Parliament, which, of course, the police don't have a right to do. At least they do if they're preventing uh, loss of life and limb and uh, protect, uh, preventing uh, f further harm to people. Um, but um, some MPs uh, and indeed peers um, weren't having that and, and said that they it was their duty to go and see what was going on. <clears throat> Not restricted to peers and MPs either, the press and the media and the television crews. And then having seen some people around, uh, then some visitors, some members of staff, um, in, decided to take the law into their own hands as well. And so you had essentially three institutions in Parliament, um, the House of Commons, the House of Lords, and the security organisation uh, giving different instructions. The Palace of Westminster was eventually evacuated, which was seen eventually by the police as the most efficient way to get everybody out so that they could make sure that there were no miscreants left in the building. That was the end result of the security operation. How long did it take before you and your team were able to exhale. 
it took some three or four or five hours from the start to uh, the end of, if you like, the evacuation of, of the building. Actually, the coordination amongst the police themselves uh, wasn't straightforward because although there was a common radio network around the police inside Parliament, um, external police had to be brought in, external armed police had to be brought in, um, and specialists in this sort of operation who were operating under their own uh, team radio networks. And uh, they wanted to do things and they brought with them their own operating procedures, which weren't immediately properly coordinated with the police in place. And so even the police in place were giving different instructions to the people in the building. Um, and it was, in the words of some people, quite chaotic, and I would agree with that. Um, and my role as Black Rod, along with the Sergeant at Arms in the House of Commons, was to try and coordinate uh, the response of the non-security people. In other words, the security people would say what had to happen, and the Sergeant at Arms in the Commons and Black Rod in the Lords tried to organise and orchestrate uh, the activity to respond to the instructions of the security authorities. Um, and, and it just, I can tell you now, it didn't work at all well. Um, and uh, it was a long day. It was very, very chaotic. What do you think the main learnings were from your longest day? One is that um, in any crisis, um, you can never fully uh, rehearse for and predict the nature of the crisis. Um, and I think what went on that day in the Palace of Westminster um, is probably the most disorganised uh, crisis I've ever been in. And I was in the army for 39 years, and I've been in quite a few crises, and quite a lot of them were quite disorganised, but nothing like this. And, and afterwards, um, we were discussing the, the lessons that came out of this and how we could do it better next time. And um, I was always reminded of you know, a principle um, which applies not just in the military, but it applies in any organisation trying to do anything, whether it's a, a football team um, or a military organisation or a bank or um, any organisation. And, and there is a and when you try and structure anything, um, uh, particularly complex organization, organizations, there are some principles which are absolutely um, eternal. Um, and that is that if you want to get unity of effect, then you have to have unity of effort. And if you want to have unity of effort, then you have to have unity of um, I, I put it in military terms, command and control, um, management and leadership. And if you don't have unity of the governing structure, whatever that is, leadership, management, call it what you want, if you don't have unity uh, in that structure, uh, then you won't have unity of effort and you won't get unity of effect. And that was no better exemplified than in this chaotic day in the Palace of Westminster, because it was almost impossible to have unity of governance, partly because there are two houses there um, and partly because there were several different agencies who were all tasked with elements of crisis management. So the security and the police force, obviously leaders and and in any uh, crisis incident, whether it's out on the street, in, a, in an airport or wherever, but the police have primacy when there is a security incident of that nature. The police have primacy. Um, but in this case, um, the police didn't themselves, uh, in the event on the ground, uh, at the outset, they had unity of uh, effort and 
um, uh, because they had unity of command and control. But as soon as external agencies came in, uh, that unity of uh, governance uh, broke down because they weren't all on the same radio net. They had uh, different protocols. Uh, they didn't all have a common understanding of the situation. And this is very normal. When you, when you have a, a crisis situation, you don't have time to regulate it in a sort of stately dance by getting everybody in, making sure that they all understand the situation situation, that they all are on the same radio network, that they all understand the security protocols, that they all understand the context which they're going into. Um, and of course, that's not possible when life and limb are at risk and, uh, and governance structure breaks down. And I think this is, if you like, for your listeners, one of the first things that you've got to accept and acknowledge is going to happen. Um, that when responders arrive, whether it's members of the public, whether it's the security, the blue light services uh, or others, um, if they're coming in and there's a threat to life and limb, they're going to do what they think is right to stop life, to prevent life and limb. And that may bulldoze right through some of the protocols and niceties and courtesies and, um, and organization uh, that you have in place. And that's what happened in the Palace of Westminster. Mm -hmm. And that's why it looked a little bit like chaos. Mm -hmm. But actually, uh, the police who did come in, who were doing what they wanted to do because they knew how they, were, they, how they had to get the, find the terrorists or miscreants, as I'd like to call them. Um, they were, they were doing the right thing. And to us, it looked like they were, uh, there was chaos and out of control, um, because we didn't know and we weren't told what they were doing. So that was the first thing. The second thing is communication. When chaos breaks out, as it will in any crisis, um, then the greatest criticism, and it, this was the case uh, on this day in, in the Palace of Westminster, the greatest criticism of everybody, police, black rod, sergeant at arms, the the parliamentary authorities and everything, um, even the whips uh, to the parties, uh, the biggest criticism was that we, we, we failed to have, um, concerted communications, a common message going out to everyone. It was incredibly frustrating because we were locked down. So we weren't allowed to move from one office to another. And, um, to get that many constituencies all onto one message was extremely difficult because uh, people weren't in their offices, didn't have their iPads or their phones. Communications is probably the most underestimated part of contingency planning for crises, um, the method of getting messages out. And one of the biggest lessons that Parliament learned from this was actually we could have done a whole lot better because there is a great big speaker system around the whole of uh, Parliament. And actually, um, and, and it's a military thing too, if you want to command an operation, um, be in the place where you can best see what's going on and control what's going on. And the only way you can control what's going on is to communicate. Um, and, and sometimes there is a, uh, well, there's always actually a conundrum between being in the right place to see what's going on and being in the right place to communicate so that you can control what's going on. Um, and that's, but that's a, a what I call a, a minor uh, a, a minor command difficulty that happens to police, fire services, military, anyone who's running an organization. But, but communications is, is a really, really important part of, of crisis management. Are you feeling stuck? Has conflict got you down? Have you considered mediation? Mediation is a confidential and flexible way to resolve conflicts 86% of all mediations end in a solution, saving time, money, and stress for all involved. Thanet Mediation Center, a Broadstairs consulting initiative, offers mediation services to individuals and organizations in Thanet, Kent, and further afield. For more information or advice, email us at info at broadstairsconsulting.com. We are here to help you move forwards. I can see why this longest day was immensely frustrating for you, particularly, given your experience and your training. What was the one character trait that you think served you really well in getting through that crisis? Uh, a thick skin, because when there is a crisis, people get angry. 
um, people get very angry. On that day, uh, the politicians got angry because uh, the communications weren't good. Uh, there were mixed messages coming from from me, from the sergeant arms, from the police, the security control, big, big, for all the reasons I've just explained. Uh, there wasn't a, uh, the security um, authorities themselves um, put out mixed messages, and that frustrated people, um, and it made people angry, and they lashed out. Um, the speakers lashed out at me. I can remember one in particular who was quite vociferous. Um, uh, the leaders uh, were, were were cross that the, that uh, the parliamentary authorities, of which the sergeant at arms and I were amongst, you know, the forefront of managing crises, um, couldn't manage it. We couldn't get it under control. We couldn't give common messages out. Um, uh, so people were very angry and lashed out um, and got very cross indeed. And uh, and the. Um, the senior parliamentary officials got cross. The whips got cross. Um, uh, this is very disruptive to parliamentary business. The media got cross because they were excluded. Uh, they were corralled um, uh, and they weren't allowed to do their reporting. So everybody got crossed and, and, and lashed out. And um, I, I say glibly, what was the attribute that got me through it? If, if you're a bit of a snowflake, you ain't going to get through these things because you're just going to get so beaten up by people, uh, you, you'll, you'll wilt. Um, so I say a thick skin, um, and that's a metaphor for saying you've got to have patience and tolerance and rationality and, uh, and yourself exhibit some sort of um, standing authority, calm, mm. um, and not react um, and try and be constant. So that's probably the greatest uh, uh, attribute, I guess. One of the hallmarks of crisis management is a presumption that someone steps up to the helm. Obviously, in this situation, there were lots of competing stakeholders for that control and command that you mention. How was it decided as between those with responsibility who had the final say? <clears throat> it was very straightforward who had the final say, and that was the police, because we were in a situation where it wasn't just a bit of disorder, um, where, as happens quite often, um, you get a, an incident in the visitor's gallery in, in one of the chambers, um, or, or there's a disruption at a, a parliamentary event uh, in one of the committee rooms, or uh, uh, and, and a, a small uh, disorder that goes on, or even um, an incident that could potentially be um, a, a disruptive incident um, around the chamber. Um, in, those, in those cases, um, the police have primacy in dealing with that incident. And so one calls the police in to deal with that incident. But managing the context around that isn't the police's responsibility. It is the responsibility of Black Rod and the sergeant at arms, um, to con whose, whose remit, amongst other things, is to control access, order and discipline in the house, if you see what I mean. So if there's a small incident, the police will come and deal it deal with it and handle it. Indeed, um, Black Rod and the Sergeant at Arms are um, authorised to, to um, invite the police in um, and, and instruct the police to deal with something. Uh, and the police are authorised to do that. Um, and then Black Rod and the Sergeant at Arms will, will, will control the context around that. If it's a really, really big incident, as this potentially was, I mean, there could have been armed, armed uh, people um, marauding around the Palace of Westminster, killing people at will. And there was a risk that that was going to happen. Under those circumstances, Black Rod and the Sergeant at Arms plainly aren't going to have control of the context. It's the police who have to have uh, control of the context. And Black Rod and the Sergeant at Arms would support them in, in doing that. And that's what we were trying to do. And I think many people thought that Black Rod and the Sergeant at Arms were the people who were controlling it or should have been controlling it. Um, but of course, we were having to act uh, in response to what the police wanted. Um, and as I said, in the case, we got mixed messages about how they wanted us to react. And then we didn't have the means of communication. In this instance, obviously, there were 
predetermined policies and procedures that were intended to be followed. How important were pre-existing relationships in the resolution of this incident? Oh, um, very important. And I might have painted up a picture that it was totally dysfunctional and totally chaotic. Of course, it wasn't, uh, actually. Um, and I had, I managed to establish a, a very good uh, rapport and communication to uh, the key people in, in the House of Lords, uh, at the House of Lords end of the Palace of Westminster, which was where, in this sort of an instance, my primary responsibility lay. So, um, I had good communications with the Lord Speaker, with the Leader of the House, uh, and the 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 the, the senior um, clerk in the House. Um, and and I had reasonably good communications with them. I, I went dashing around briefing them of what the latest situation was and what the police wanted. Um, and and I think they had trust in me. I, I, I can't speak for the House of Commons end, and I, I wouldn't want to speak for the House of Commons end, but I, I don't think it worked quite as well there um, because I don't think the relationships were necessarily... Um, established. And, and here's another thing. It's all very well having good relationships between key people in these things. But if key people aren't there, and, and certainly both in the House of Lords and in the House of Commons, some key people were not there. And so you can't rely just on having, I mean, it helps if there are good rapport and relationships between key people when crises break out. I mean, it absolutely helps if you understand people and and if you have trust in people as well. You know somebody, you know, for example, if the Black Rod is a really reliable, experienced person who can, you know, deal with stuff, then people are inclined to deal with him. Uh, to, to, if Black Rod's not there on the day, um, his deputy's not there on the day, people look around and say, well, who's going to handle this? Um, so I, I think one of the one of the key things, and and this this applies. It's it's another golden rule of of any planning, um, but this particularly applies, and I've learned this in the military. Um, you have to understand that in the military, if you go into an operation at the start of the operation, everybody's there. I'm afraid in a military operation, not everybody is necessarily going to be there by the end of it. And so there has to be some resilience and in uh, and some contingency in there for replacing the command and control when the command and control or the people doing it are not available or go down or go missing or get out of communication because mm -hmm. communication is mm -hmm. disrupted. And so here is the key thing. Um, in a military operation, the, the vital thing is that when you're planning it, when you're running it, and before you execute it, you make sure that everybody down the chain is in the mind of their superior so that they know what the objective is, they know what the contingencies are, they know what the the alternative options are, so that when it goes wrong, they can do the right thing without having to be told. And this is all part of training in the military, so that um, you can say to people, this is what we're going to do, it's going to be, and, and people say, yep, got it, and we've done this in training before, and if it goes wrong, we'll adapt, uh, and we can respond, because we know the reactions and responses, and we know what's in the, in the, in the commander's mind. If the commander's there and can shape things so much better, um, but if it doesn't, then you'll probably get, you know, um, a, a, a good reaction, if not perfect. In an organisation like Parliament, you can't train everybody and all the visitors and all the media to do the right thing in a set of circumstances. Uh, and I think, therefore, you have to accept, just as you do in the military, that the unexpected and the unexplained um, and the unprepared for um, is going to happen. And in somewhere like Parliament, it's more likely to be like that because on the day in question, you could have... 50,000 people inside Parliament, who, who the majority of whom are there for the first time in their lives. So how can you ever tell people what to do and how to react when there are so many people with different ideas who aren't in the, in, in the, in the security protocols or in the response protocols that are necessary for a place like that? You mention having a thick skin and you talk about the importance of being a resilient leader. How did the failures associated with this event help you to be an even better leader? Well, one of the key attributes I think of 
anybody who is leading or managing anything is to share um, responsibility um, for both success and failure and not to be shy about it. And the best way to share responsibility for failure is to lead in the learning. And uh, if you can lead the learning and bring along others with you, not just subordinates, um, because in a place like Parliament, just as in a bank or uh, in an airport, not everybody, you don't have nice command chain where somebody's in charge and, you know, the leader comes up with some learnings and he brings everybody along in nice lessons. And uh, and that's, that's the easy thing. The difficult thing, um, if you are a leader with responsibility for something like contingency planning or crisis management, you may not be the top guy, but you're responsible for that That. Uh, activity and you're responsible for, for making sure it gets done and it's absorbed, then you've got to promote that to not just the subordinates who may be reporting to you, um, but you've got to do it to colleagues who sit alongside you and to people who are infinitely superior to you, whether that's MPs and peers and speakers and uh, whips and government ministers and so on. Um, but in a bank, it may be the directors and, and so on who, you know, who are busy guys um, and uh, don't have time for this sort of thing. But when, when, when the shit hits the fan, um, they're going to look for someone who's going to be responsible. Um, and, and so I think when these things have happened, um, you're leading upwards as well as downwards. And uh, that's where tact and diplomacy and experience comes into play. So last question for you. If you had to live your longest day again, what food would you choose to fuel it? <laughs> I don't think it would be food. I think the most important ingredient is water because uh, one of the things which, um, and it always happens when there's a crisis, um, uh, it always happens for some reason when everybody's hot. Um, it always happens on a hot day or in a hot building and you have to close the windows and it gets hotter. And so you sweat a lot. And And if you're... Uh, tense, you sweat. Uh, if you're busy running around the place, you sweat. Uh, and you need to stay hydrated. And I don't think it's any different whether you're in the boxing ring, um, uh, on a football field, um, in a, in a very tense negotiation. Um, the tension is high and drinking water is a relaxant. Um, it keeps you hydrated and it's better than whiskey under these situations. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, it, it's been so interesting for me uh, to hear about the intricacies of your role. And I know that many of our listeners will feel the same. So thank you so much for being willing to be so honest um, about your experiences and to share so candidly. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you, Leah. <laughs> You've been listening to a Broadstairs Consulting Limited podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Tune in soon to hear the next installment of The Longest Day. Copyright 2023. Production copyright. Broadstairs Consulting Limited. All rights reserved. <laughs>